Hello, I'm Christian Dunn, Managing Partner of Strategic Institute for Innovation and Government Contracting. I'm sitting down virtually today with Rick Dunn, founder of Strategic Institute for Innovation and Government Contracting, to ask what I think is a very important question. As the marketing outreach person here at SI, I also receive feedback regarding other transactions. One of the objections I hear as far as not using OTs is, what about government protections? And at first, when I first heard this, I thought this was a noble thing. This, these were noble words. But later I realized there are really significant consequences to this. Mike Griffin, former Undersecretary of Defense for Research and Engineering, testified to Congress and he said that on average, it takes 16 and a half years to develop a new capability, obviously much longer for a major system, where it takes China only three. Eric Schmidt, the former CEO of Google, uh, spent time as the chair of the Defense Innovation Board. One of his quotes was, DOD breaks pretty much every rule in modern product development. Still, other studies show that government-specific cost burdens that add no additional value are by some estimates as high as 50% on every transaction. Again, government-specific with no added value. Additionally, a recent study shows that the defense industrial base continues to shrink at an alarming pace. Okay, so we've got drawn out timelines. These don't really protect the warfighter. You've got high cost premiums. That doesn't protect the taxpayer. And you've got a shrinking industrial base. That doesn't really protect national interest. So Rick, who do these protections protect? Well, Christian, it's good to be here uh, with you virtually as, uh, as we are. And, uh, and thanks for that question. The, the issue of uh, other transactions agreements lacking protections, quote unquote, of the traditional contracting system is one that seems to come up periodically. It, it, uh, it has never been put to rest for some reason. It's, it's, it's kind of a mindless question because it usually comes up with just the simple assertion that OTs don't have the protections of a traditional procurement contract. First of all, you know, are we just talking about protections that are in the federal acquisition regulation, FAR, or is this question supposed to reach out to, to JCIDs, the requirements process, the uh, aspects of the major acquisition system, or, or even the budget system, or is it really concentrated on FAR? And I, I think for the most part, it really relates to other transactions versus federal acquisition regulation procurement contracts. Uh, in just that particular context. Uh, certainly that's the way it was brought up uh, in the 2005 uh, Senate Airland uh, Subcommittee hearings of the Senate Armed Services Committee by so-called public interest group um, witnesses. So um, you're, you're right. First of all, the, uh, the system as it is has been criticized uh, for costing too much and taking too long to field uh, new capabilities. I mean, this, those are the words of the Packard Commission back in 1986 and, and more recently in the testimony of the Section 800 panel, uh, 809 panel um, commissioners before Congress in 2018, they said the system is getting worse, not better. So cost too much takes too long is sort of the standard system. I mean, 10 plus years for new capabilities. I think you cited uh, uh, Undersecretary Griffin at 16 and a half years on average to field new capabilities. So really, if the system takes too long and costs too much, how does that benefit the traditional system? How does that benefit either the taxpayer or the warfighter? But let, let's, let's try to come to grips to understand, you know, what these protections might be since they're generally not specified. Something in the terms and conditions of the agreement. Uh, things that have been pointed out by people who have done studies uh, to try to come to grips with this issue are things like termination clause, dispute clause, uh, accounting and audit, um, changes clause, 
data rights and other intellectual property. All of those things that I just mentioned show up in OT agreements, sometimes by incorporating the, the actual FAR clause into the OT agreement or being addressed in some other way by mutual agreement uh, of the parties. So they're sort of those protections, if that's what people consider them to be, uh, are addressed in OT agreements. And, and the key point is an other transaction agreement could actually look exactly like a procurement contract. It could incorporate all the clauses of a procurement contract. Typically, they don't do that because it makes no sense to do that. Um, far or more than far. A lot of the, some of the cost drivers that uh, have been cited, and by the way, the, the most disciplined study of, of uh, additive costs, the cost premium was by a Coopers and Lyburn study in the 90s, which was reviewed by the GAO in the, in the 2000s. And, and so the idea of about a, a at a minimum, about a 20% cost premium, it's pretty well established. And of course, some estimates go much, much higher than that. So if the taxpayer and the warfighter are not protected by these alleged protections of, of the FAR, who is? That was your question, I think. Who is protected? And I'd say that the system as it is protects insiders. And by insiders, I mean, first of all, major defense contractors. They are burdened with the business processes and um, the clauses that the FAR system imposes on them. They have, they have created a company to do business with DOD and Com com comply with all the DOD rules. So they're burdened, but they're also reimbursed for all those costs. So it's valuable to them, e even though all those processes don't add value to the delivered product or service. So those, those imposed requirements also constitute a barrier to entry for new entrants into the defense industrial base. And in that sense, they are protections for the established defense contractors. Other insiders are actually the practitioners of government contracting, the acquisition bureaucrats. They are experts in, with arcane knowledge, uh, arcane knowledge of all of these government insider business processes and practices. They know how to plug in terms and conditions. But the other interesting thing is most contracting officers have never read the majority of the contract clauses that, that they put into contracts. And the reason is because they don't have to. Their obligation is just to make sure that those clauses go in the contract. What effect those clauses have, uh, whether they add uh, costs without adding value, that's not really their problem or their concern. FAR 2.101 defines the duties of a contracting officer, and the first duty is to comply with all the laws, executive orders, and regulations, and make sure that the contract that you, you sign uh, does. Uh, so the, the system is, is, almost, is, is kind of institutionally corrupt in, in, in that manner. So I, I think what we're dealing with here is just a sort of a mindless mantra that says um, OTs don't have the protections of our contracts. OTs, other transactions, require people to think, understand what terms and conditions make sense in light of the goals of the particular uh, agreement. So I, I would just say, uh, who benefits from the so-called protections of government procurement contracts, insiders, the acquisition bureaucrats, the big defense contractors that are burdened with require, uh, complying with all of those requirements. Uh, and the uh, warfighter and the taxpayer are not protected. Uh, and in fact, they are disadvantaged uh, by uh, all of those requirements.